Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Taylor Kemp, and I'm on staff here at the Bridge Church. Uh, and just before we jump into the message this morning, I want to encourage you to do three things. I want to encourage you to connect, I want to encourage you to give, and I want to encourage you to engage. All right, so, so the first thing we want you to do is if you're, if you're new with us, or maybe you've been attending online for a little while, but you just haven't had a chance to do this, we, we want to encourage you to go to our website, thebridgechurchcc.com, all right, uh, and find a little button on the main page that says connect. So it's going to take you to our welcome card uh, where you can fill that out and uh, this way we can get to know you a little bit and maybe help you plug um, into our family here in Charles City. And uh, The second thing I want to encourage you to do is to give. So here at the Bridge Church we talk a lot about how um, if we're believers in Jesus it is our responsibility to give and be generous towards others um, and to our local church as well. And so God has been so unbelievably absolutely generous to us and in everything that we have and so we believe we need to also make sure that we are being generous back to him and so we want to encourage you again go to our website thebridgechurchcc.com find the little button in the top right hand corner it says giving uh, sign up and start giving to your local church today and then finally uh, we want to encourage you to engage so as you're joining us online it's easy to just set it and forget it uh, get the message going you can get the live stream up and running and then do our thing so uh, we want to make sure that um, we build community online and so that's what church is really about is it's about community and fellowship and, and that comes with uh, you engaging and interacting through the chat box so so talk to your hosts uh, talk to other people online and, and try to do the best that you can to get to know one another and, and see what God has for you for through through building connections and, and fellowship. Once again, the message is going to start soon, but we're so glad that you're joining us and we look forward to hopefully seeing you someday in person. God bless.
How are we doing, guys? Did we survive BBS? Did you guys check out that, the backup dancer in the video? That guy was on point, huh? <laughs> so that was the first year I got to do PBS, and I have to confess, it was really fun. So if you're kind of apprehensive about getting in there, guys, I had a lot of fun doing that. And so that was the first time I ever uh, got to give it a shot, kind of by, oh, you're here, so you're a warm body, jump in there. But uh, nevertheless, it was a good time, guys. Um, if we never met before, my name is Eric Voss. I'm the Celebrate Recovery Pastor here at the Bridge. Um, and this morning, we're going to jump into a series on Jonah. Um, we were going to start this series a few weeks ago, and um, we didn't. Many of you know, um, at the end of June, my father passed away, and um, shortly after, a, a close family friend did. And I just wanted to take a minute this morning. Um, as hard as that was, as hard as that was for our family, um, I just want to say thank you to, to all the members of the church family for... Um, you know, phone calls and text messages and just checking in, hey, is there anything that you need from us? And all kinds of you guys showed up to our house with food and um, a hug and just, you know, whatever we needed. And what a beautiful picture of God's church, of, of the bride of Christ, you know. And um, I was thinking about, you know, Jesus' words, this is how I, you know you are my people by how you love one another. And there's non-believers in my family. Uh, and they got to sit there and they got to watch God's church show up and just be there for one another. So thank you for that, guys. Because what a testimony to the, Christ of Jesus, the, the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? I just want to take a minute and say thank you guys so much from the bottom of our hearts, from all the bosses. We appreciate it so much um, for this being our family. So here we are, two weeks removed from all that, and we're going to go ahead and get into this series on Jonah. We're going to be here for the next four weeks. We're going to study the entire book. We're going to read the entire book. Um, but in the spirit of VBS, I wanted to tell you a story about little Amanda. Little Amanda is an eight-year-old girl, and she just loves Jesus. She knows all the Bible stories, and, and little Amanda is the girl that sits on the front of her chair in Sunday church, and she's always raising her hand, and she's always the one you call to, and she has all the answers for everything you could possibly ask in Sunday school. You guys know little Amanda, right? Amanda loves God, and she loves the Bible, and she knows every single story there is to know in Scripture, and Amanda loves the Bible and loves Jesus so much that she would stop her family and her friends and anybody she, that would listen, and she'd talk about Cain and Abel, and she'd talk about Noah's Ark, and she'd talk about David and Goliath. She just loved Jesus so much she couldn't help but talk about him. One day... Amanda's uncle Clarence visited from a neighboring state. And Uncle Clarence was quite a bit different than Amanda. In fact, if you would ask Uncle Clarence what he thought about God, he would say, there is no God. Uncle Clarence, in fact, was an atheist. But that didn't stop little Amanda from telling her Uncle Clarence all about God, just like she did everyone else she encountered. In fact, Amanda told Uncle Clarence about Jonah. And she started going into the story of Jonah. She talked about how God had called Jonah to go to this great city. And she talked about how Jonah had disappeared and left and ran from God. And she talked, of course, about how Jonah was swallowed by this great fish, only to be picked up by God and the fish and spewed out. And how Jonah would land in the great city anyway. Now, Clarence loved his niece very much, but... He didn't believe in God, and he couldn't resist asking Amanda a few questions. Jonah, huh? You actually believe that this guy Jonah was a real person? Well, of course I do, Uncle Clarence. Why wouldn't I? And he was swallowed by this great fish, and he was vomited up on the shore, and he survived to tell all about this. You believe this story, and little Amanda, without missing a beat, I do believe in Uncle Clarence, and when I get to heaven, I can't wait to walk up to Jonah and ask him all about it. What do you think it smells like inside a fish, Uncle Clarence? <laughs> Uncle Clarence, by now, he's a little bit irritated. And he says, well, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and Jonah's not there? Without missing a beat, little Amanda says, I don't know, Uncle Clarence. 
I guess you can ask him then if you get my drift. So this is a fictional story, guys. And if you grew up in the church or if you even had kids in Sunday school or maybe VBS, you're probably familiar with the story of Jonah because for years we used this story in children's church and kids' curriculum to teach important lessons like you can't turn from God and disobedience to Him oftentimes causes difficulty in our lives. Now, these are really valuable lessons that we find in the book of Jonah, but by the end of this series, I hope we find something a lot more valuable because there is so much to unpack from this thing. It is so rich with theology. It is so rich with things we can learn for the 21st century that I would hate for any of you to miss it. So when we talk about Jonah, what's the first thing that comes to everybody's mind? The fish, right? Everyone remembers the fish. Did you know that this fish that we all remember so well only is only in three verses of that entire book? There's only three verses that even mention this fish. We have four chapters of text, four chapters of the entire text, yet we only remember these three verses. All that to say is I wonder how many of us have been focusing on the wrong part of the story. Because some of you here today are maybe a little bit like Uncle Clarence. You focus on, well, how does a man survive in the belly of a fish for three days? And because you don't think this is possible, because this is Old Testament theology, you dismiss the book of Jonah. You think maybe that's folklore anyway, and then you completely miss what Jonah the prophet has to offer all of us today. Guys, I get it. A story like this is hard to wrap your minds around, but we need to understand that the Bible is full, full of extraordinary events, isn't it? Like the Savior going to the cross willingly to, rise himself, to raise himself three days later is pretty extraordinary. And we discount one, it's pretty hard not to discount another, right? Did you know that Jesus actually described himself about or jo, jo, Jesus actually used Jonah to describe himself. He said these words. He said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. As Jonah was in the belly of a fish, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. It begs the question what did Jesus believe about Jonah? So if you're sitting there today and, and you, you want to continue to focus on what you learned in Sunday school and, and the great fish, and you want to ask questions like, is this a historical narrative or is this hyperbole? How should I take this story? Then I'm afraid you're missing the point and you're missing what Jonah has to offer us. Truth is, all of Scripture have something to everyone. And the three references that, verse, that, this, that reference the fish is minuscule compared to what we're going to learn about Jonah over the next four, four weeks. Let's pray. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Okay, so this week we're going to start, pick things up right in Jonah 1. We're going to start right in verse 1. We're going to read all of chapter 1. So if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn to Jonah now. Like I said earlier, Jonah's in the Old Testament. It's four chapters, so it's a relatively small book in a very big Old Testament. Every single Bible has a, a table of contents. It's in, within the first few pages. There's no shame in looking at the table of contents. I invite you to look at the table of contents, find a page for Jonah, just to kind of help you find where that is in your Bible. Guys, if you're new with us, I want to let you know that we don't put the main passage of Scripture on the screen behind me. There is so much value in digging into God's Word and to holding that Word in your hands and, and to reading it as one body. I'd hate for you to miss that opportunity. So if you don't have a Bible, we do provide some for you. If you look on the row in front of you, there's a chair rack. It should have some black Bibles in there. Again, there's a table of contents. Go ahead and flip right to the front, and that's going to help you find Jonah. If you're a tech person... You can also download the YouVersion Bible app. This is a free download at any Play Store, Google, Apple, whatever you got there. You can download this. You'll be able to follow along with us. You'll be able to read scripture. You'll be able to do devotionals if you so choose. So while you guys are finding Jonah 1.1, I want to take a minute and, and give you some context, not only for what we're reading now, but really what we're going to get into over the next four weeks. 
So some background information is going to help us kind of understand what exactly is we are reading here. So we're going Old Testament, which means Jonah is long past. Moses has led the people out of Egypt. They've been in the desert. They crossed the Jordan River with Joshua. They're through the period of the judges. And then Israel says, hey, we want a king. Give us a king. So we have the time of King Saul and King David and King Solomon. And during that time, Israel's united and Israel is prospering and Israel is growing. But then King Solomon died and we get pride and arrogance, and we have a split in the nation of Israel. We have a split in God's people, and we have the nation of Israel to the north, and we have the nation of Judea to the south, and each nation has their own kings. Each nation has their own prophets, and Jonah is one such prophet. He's a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel under King Jeroboam II. This is about 800 years before Jesus ever walked the earth. Now, we don't know a lot about Jonah. We have his book that he left for us. We have a couple mentions in, in Scripture, one that we already covered, and then we have this one, which I think sheds some light on what it is we're getting into. This is from 2 Kings, which is a historical narrative in the Old Testament, but it says this, Jeroboam II, son of Jehoash, began to rule over Israel in the 15th year of King Amaziah's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 41 years. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Jeroboam II recovered the territories of Israel between Labo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, Sam of Amittai, prophet from Gath Hefer. Now, that's pretty subtle, isn't it? But this is really important, and this is what we need to understand as we understand about Jonah when we jump into this series. So we have Jeroboam the second, the king, and he's doing evil in the sight of the Lord. That's what the text gives us that. So most prophets' job was to be the mouthpiece of God, to speak out against them. So most prophets of the time, Amos and Hosea, are speaking out against the evil that this text is talking to us about. But we got Jonah. And Jonah, this is And Jonah is talking about this land that they're getting back. So while all these other prophets are bringing messages of God's wrath and calling people to repentance, Jonah's message up until now is pretty positive. He's saying, hey, our kingdom is expanding. The Lord is giving us some, uh, some of our land back. He's bringing this positive message. He's bringing all this good news to the people. And he's beloved for it, most likely. Then... God gives him his next assignment. And that's where we're going to pick things up today. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that all the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell asleep into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country from? Whose people are you? See all the panic going on with the sailors. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they said, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked, what should we do to make the sea grow calm for us? 
Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to drive back, row back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. And, this, and these men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to them. We're going to stop there and Taylor's going to pick that up next week. Jonah's a pretty stand-up guy, don't you think? We got a prophet, a, a, one of God's chosen people, and like three verses into this story, he's dipping. God's saying, go do this, and he's like, no way, I'm going to go do this instead. It's really important to understand why a prophet, why one of God's chosen people would blatantly disregard God, I think. Like, why would, why would he do that? He's supposed to be the mouthpiece of God? Why would he just completely disregard everything that God had told him? And I think the answer lies in the text, verses 1 and 2. God was telling him to go to Nineveh, right? He was telling him to go to Nineveh. And this is really important to understand because Nineveh is the capital and kind of the hub of the Assyrian Empire of Assyria. And the biggest threat to Israel at the time was the Assyrians, right? So if you're a history buff, you may know like 30 or 40 years down the road, Assyria would conquer the northern kingdom. They'd take everybody captive. And Jonah is called to preach there. See, the, Assy the Israelites and the Assyrians were bitter enemies at the time. So to kind of put this in kind of today's context for you, it'd be like God telling President Zelensky of Ukraine saying, hey, go to Moscow and preach. It's kind of something like that. So you can kind of get the idea of what Jonah's, Jonah's going through. So Jonah panics and Jonah runs, doesn't he? I think Jonah runs like many of us would run, right? Given the same task. And, and, and Jonah runs, he blatantly disregards God, and yet God pursues him, doesn't he? It's kind of a little mini message for you this morning as we walk through life. Even when we're running from God, God is still pursuing us. He's still pursuing us out of love, and even when we think we're going from Him, even when we think we can hide for God, He pursues us out of love. And if, if you're here this morning, maybe you just need to hear that God is pursuing you. Jonah's full of little bits and nuggets like this, and we're going to talk about three more this, this morning as we start to unpack what this has for us today. Number one is this. There's peace and surrender. There's peace and surrender. During my time at Indiana Wesleyan at Bible College, we took a preaching class and we studied Jonah. We started this whole book. It was about six weeks long. We did a very in-depth study of this. And no matter how many times I study this book, Jonah doesn't jump off the page to me. The giant fish doesn't jump off the page. The Ninevites don't jump off the page. The one thing that gets me every single time I study this book is the sailors. The sailors. Did you notice how there's this storm going on around them and the sailors, they're grasping to everything they possibly can, hoping that this storm, cal the storm calms down. In verses 4 and 5, they're, they're, they says, it says the storm comes up and it's so violent, they immediately start saying, God, please help us. And when their gods don't help them, what do they do? They start dumping things overboard. They start casting lights. They start rowing as hard and as fast as they can to try to get back, to try to weather this storm. And yet the storm rages on. It is only after they surrender that they find any peace. And, and I think the sailors really speak to our human condition. Some of you today are in the middle of some kind of storm and you've been doing everything in your power to try to weather that storm, to try to survive. You're throwing cargo overboard. You're rowing as hard and as fast as you possibly can and the storm just gets worse and worse and worse. I know this because I lived like this for years. 16 years old, I was addicted to methamphetamine and I was in the middle of a storm for almost 20 years of my life. 
I was just like the sailors were. I was throwing everything I possibly could overboard. I was rowing as hard and as fast as I could to try to find refuge from the storm. I was changing jobs and moving to a new town and, and getting new friends and, and divorcing my wife. All the while, the storm just kept coming and coming and coming. It was only after we surrendered to God's will, God's way, does the storm subside and, and do we find peace. Some of you are in the same boat as the sailors are in Jonah. And maybe your storm's not caused by drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's something more subtle. There's tons of storms out there. There's past traumas. There's resentments we hold on to about other people that causes uneasiness and storms inside of us. And like the sailors, you're dumping cargo. You're doing everything you can possibly do to try to weather this storm. And yet the storm rages on. And if that's you, I challenge you, maybe it's time to figure out what surrender means. Number two, our intuitions lie to us. Our intuitions lie. This is a big one. Because we think our thoughts and our feelings and our intuitions and all those things going on inside of us are true, but they lie to us. What they are not is a barometer to determine whether or not we are walking in step with God's Holy Spirit. We're going to look at, at Jonah again. So we have Jonah. He hears God saying, hey, go and do this. Go to Nineveh and preach the word. And then he goes in the exact opposite direction, right? Now we can make some assumptions based on Jonah's action as to what he was feeling and what was going on. If you go down to 5 and 6, it tells you there's this huge calamity going on around Jonah. The sailors are freaking out. They're pitching all their stuff overboard. They're praying. And where is Jonah? He's asleep. He is asleep. He made a conscious decision to blatantly disregard what God had for him. Didn't say he was tossing and turning at night. Didn't say that he felt bad about it. Didn't say that he was pondering whether I was doing right or wrong. No, it says he went below deck and fell into a deep sleep. I kind of imagine Jonah hearing from God and saying, yeah, okay, and then him going down, he buys his ticket, he walks onto the boat, and he's like, I think God changed his mind. We're good here. I think I'll take a nap. And too often, we respond to God in the exact same way. See, we rely on how we feel or what we think or how we understand an event instead of God's word to us. And then we believe because I feel okay about the choices I've made, because someone around me has justified them to me, I must be walking in step with God's spirit. Well, I don't feel bad about the choices I'm making. I guess God must have made an exception for me. He must be good with this. Listen, the problem with this, guys, is our intuitions lie to us. The intu Jonah's intuitions lied to him, and they are still lying to us today. The prophet Jeremiah actually confirms this in his word to us. He says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Translation. If God is telling you something, if you read something in his word, if he gives you an audible word, and then you ignore him like Jonah did, you do the opposite, and then believe because God didn't come down and slap you on the hand or make you lose, lose sleep over the choice you met, made, and you still believe you are walking in step with God's spirit, then you are lying to yourself. 90% of what God wants to tell you is in his word. And when we rely on our thoughts and our intuitions and our emotions to determine whether or not we walk in step with God's Holy Spirit, we are deceiving ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. The barometer for whether or not we are walking in step with God is never solely based on our thoughts and feelings. We have to check it against God's word. We have to check it against God's people to determine, is this really what God has for me? If you fail to do this, if you fail to listen to God's word over your emotions and your intuitions, don't be surprised when you're below deck and the storm is raging all around you 
and you're fast asleep, screaming out, why, God, why? Number three is we're called to put our theology above our sociology. And this is going to be our last point for the morning, and I'm going to get ready to land this plane here quickly. Um, If you're not familiar with these terms, theology basically means what we believe about God. Sociology means what we believe about people or people groups. So again, we're going to start with Jonah. So Jonah's called to reach Nineveh, right? We already established that's an enemy capital of the Assyrian Empire. They're fierce enemies, and, and, and Jonah goes the opposite direction, right? We remember this? See, Jonah looked at the Assyrians. He saw someone that was evil. He saw someone that was brutal. He saw people that were threatening enemies. He saw his sociological beliefs, and he goes the opposite way because Jonah allowed his sociology to dictate his theology. He runs away, and God gets angry, right? So it only makes sense if we don't want to anger God. Maybe if you do the opposite of what Jonah did. This is where the rubber is going to meet the road for a lot of us today. Because here's the deal. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, maybe you come to celebrate recovery often. You probably understand that we find peace and surrender, especially if you're part of our CR program. That's like day one stuff. Freedom from the storm is found when we surrender to God and what he has for us. If you're a theologian of God's word, if you study his word like we encourage you to do here at the Bridge Church, you probably understand that the truth is found not in how I think or feel, but in his holy word to us. But there isn't a person in this room, including myself, who understands what it means to put theology over sociology every single step of the day. Because to get this right, you must understand what it means to completely embody what Jesus said when he said, love others as I have loved you. And when you were with us last week, Pastor Tim kind of called us all to the mat on this. He told us that it is our theology that teaches us we are to love our enemies as God loves us. And Jonah missed this completely. He missed this about as bad as you can miss anything there is to miss. Because Jonah didn't see the Assyrians as people to love or people to be saved. He saw them as a threat. He saw them as evil. And he saw them as undeserving of the love of God. In his mind, the Assyrians deserved wrath, but definitely not love expressed to them. So what about all of you do... Do you understand what it means to to love your enemies as God loved yourself? Or do you put your thoughts and your ideas and how you understand different people and people groups ahead of the theology that God has placed in your life? What comes first for you, theology or sociology? You know, I only ask because for Jonah, when he got this wrong, it was absolutely catastrophic for him. As we close today, I just want to give you guys a couple of questions, and the first is this. This is not a trick question. First service kind of looked at me blankly when I asked, but this is not a trick question. Who sets the standards for how we place theology over sociology for us in the room today? Same blank stare. It's Jesus, guys. It's all, the, if you're, if you're, it's always Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. Jesus sets the standard for us. Let me tell you what I mean. You remember the woman at the well? Jesus is in the middle of his ministry. And he's going through Samaria. We talked about that from 2 Kings. And the Samaritans and the Jews don't get along. And he sits next to the woman at the well and he says, hey, can you get me a drink? And the woman immediately allows her sociology to dictate the situation. He says, she says, I am a Samaritan. You are a Jew. How is it that you can even ask me for a drink? But Jesus says, what I am offering you is living water. What you have, what I am offering you is for even you too. Jesus' theology trumped the sociology norm of the day. The same thing happened when they brought the woman caught in the adultery. All these women, or this woman comes to Jesus and all these people are like, our norm is to stone this woman. What do you say, pastor? She says, my grace 
is sufficient for you too. If they don't judge you, neither do I go in peace. And all throughout Jesus' ministry, he's talking and ministering to tax collectors and, and sinners, and, and he's healing lepers. When society says you are unworthy, you are dirty, you shouldn't even associate them, Jesus understood that, hey, my love, my theology that I'm leaving you trumps the sociological norms of the day because Jesus Christ says that love and grace is for all people. Jonah missed this by a mile. See, Jonah had his sociology on top of his theology, and then it angered God. And you know something? When we do what Jonah did, God still gets angry. God still gets angry because of followers of Jesus Christ. We are called to put theology, we are called to put what Christ calls us to first. We are called to understand that everyone has fallen short, including ourselves, and even our enemies deserve the love of God. So this week's application is just one of preparation. Because I think part of Jonah's problem was he was so wrapped up in, in bringing the good word, hey, our kingdom's expanding, that his decision to run had a lot to do with shock factor. Maybe it never occurred to Jonah that, hey, I'm going to have to go call and reach our enemies. So this week, and really for the next four weeks as we go through this series, I just want you to thank and pray about this question, and that is this. Where is my Nineveh? Is it a specific place or, or people group? Is it your, your job or a family member or neighbor? Is it someone that maybe you sinned against or that sinned against you? This week and for the next four weeks, I just want you to understand, where is this for you? Do you have a Nineveh? If God called you to go to your Nineveh, how would you respond? If God said, I need you to reach these people, and when that time comes, would you take off and run like Jonah? Or would you be prepared to say, yes, God, I will go and show these people the love and compassion of your son, Jesus Christ, because I will always put my theology ahead of my sociology. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for your words in Jonah. I just thank you that we have this word, that we can study and mine every nugget for, Lord, that we can understand how to better live as disciples of, of Jesus Christ. Father God, I, I pray for conviction, but not conviction today, but conviction to change Lord God, that we may truly understand what it means to love and minister, not just to the easy ones, but to our personal Ninevehs as we go this week. Lord God, we love you. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.